message. <laughs> oh, there's the message. Good afternoon and good morning and welcome to yet another edition of Data Talks. Once again, transatlantic in nature uh, with three of us hosting here in the Netherlands and our honored guests uh, coming from uh, York University, which is in Canada, in Ontario. Uh, it's uh, Anna, Anna Artushnia. I hope I pronounced that. You can re-say your last name in case I haven't said it correctly. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody today. We're here uh, to have a, a short half an hour discussion, perhaps 35 minutes if we decide that there are more interesting things to say, to, uh, to talk about data governance in uh, smart cities. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we have uh, Jim Franco from our side, who is, uh, has been responsible for a lot of the work that Capgemini Invent in terms of open data, shared data, data spaces. He is a data guru here and he will be bringing his insights into the discussion as well. And of course, Ray is one of our uh, former hosts of Data Talks who has kindly passed the reins on to me. So uh, let me briefly introduce Anna, and then what we're going to do today is rather than get right into the discussion, Anna's going to take the floor for five to seven, uh, what I like to call Dutch minutes, and Dutch minutes are very <laughs> precise, uh, meaning that she'll have a short opportunity to sort of give us an introduction to what she'd like to talk about, and then three of us will uh, ask questions and generate discussion. So now Anna is a research fellow in data governance at the City Institute at York University. She has an upcoming book coming, which explores a range of policy, civic, and technological initiatives that are designed to facilitate responsible data governance in smart cities, both in North America and in Europe. And she draws on rentiership theory to analyze the changing role of the state in the digital economy and the governance challenges brought on by the adoption of biometric technologies, AI, and data trusts. Anna has uh, spoken with the BBC on the MIT Technology Review. She's uh, conducted interviews with the Toronto Star, which is uh, one of the big newspapers in Ontario. Um, <laughs> and she is happy to join us today so that she can add this to her resume. So with that, I will pass <laughs> on the floor to Anna. Uh, you you should have the ability to share your screen because I'm aware you have a, a few slides there. So we can we can try that out and and then I'll let you speak. OK, thank you. Thank sure. you for, for the wonderful introduction, David. So good morning, everyone. And today I will be talking about the public value of data and smart cities and possibly sustainable data economy. So I'll talk for about seven minutes and I'm very excited for, for the discussion. So from, from a historical perspective, it's only recently that data has been recognized as a commercial asset and as a public asset. Uh, and in terms of legislation, there's been a tremendous shift from the orally protective data policies in the public sector to the concept of data as commons. In November, uh, my colleague Alina Vernick and I published an article called The Post-Pandemic Smart Cities, where we reflect on the new European and US policies that expect cities to procure more technology and automate more public services. Well, traditional critique raised against the smart city and the smart city partnership specifically is that technology companies often lure the financially depleted municipalities into then profitable partnerships, into the bad deals. And the technology in these projects remains black box. The services are often exchanged for the personal data. And that overall, the smart city initiatives are top down and technocratic. So what I've seen in my own research is that city administrators often lack the capacity to properly evaluate the project or sustain it without a private investor. And under the new policies that give cities financial resources and political momentum to invest in the digital technology, there is a chance to redefine the data as a public asset or as a commons, if you like. In the article, we offered several recommendations to downscale smart city projects, procure locally, maintain public data service and fiber networks, make procurement of the technology by law enforcement specifically more transparent, and regulate data reuse. And I would say that among these requirements, the robust regulations that will make sure the data does not leak or it's not being sold to the highest bidder are key, key to success. And um, it's, it's good to understand what has changed over the last decades, because in the 1960s, when nations began introducing their first privacy and data protection legislation, the regulators were primarily concerned about the state surveillance. 
In this early days of the data economy, data was considered a byproduct and not a commercial asset. And as we know now, it is this legislative weight that gave rise to the extractive data economy, which after Ken Birch, I call data rentiership. And I'll explain. The problem with the rentier economy is that it is irreversibly broken. It threatens privacy and civil rights, and it stifles healthy competition. Whatever product we're looking at, be it a messenger, health app, smart refrigerator, the underlying business model is to extract as much data as possible and turn it into tradable property. Heavily dependent on the data monopolies and the material infrastructure they own, the rentier economy allows the major companies to manipulate the markets kill or buy innovation that competes with their products. And as we all know, it wouldn't allow us to shop around for better services. Now, let's remember, the rent economy flourished as a result of the private data governance that was and has been to date largely unregulated, while the actors in the public sector were not allowed to use the data they collected. But this disparity was soon overcome by the convergence of the private and state surveillance. And as, as we show in the, in the paper, this is the problem we've been dealing in North America a lot lately, where with law enforcement agencies procuring uh, digital tracking apps, facial recognition apps, without any public oversight and very few legal protections in place. And um, I'm heading towards the end here. When it comes to smart cities, the trend is even more alarming. Across the EU and the US, the city infrastructure retrofitted with digital technology has been used in police investigations. Now, imagine municipalities do, as we suggest, they procure locally and use this technology responsibly. What do we do about the fact that rentier economy has become inextricably linked with the concept of surveillance capitalism? How do we make sure the algorithms serve the public good? I would say I depart here from Zubov's argument that the entire data economy is malicious. Instead, I build on uh, on the critique of Zubov's book put out by Corey Doctor, Julie Coyne, Frank Pascal, and other brilliant scholars who, who argue that technology monopolies and the fact that they own the physical infrastructure of the internet are much bigger threats than the perceived mind control exercised by the likes of Google. And I would like to conclude with a little of provocation and with some praise of the European data initiatives. In my view, and based on my own research, creating a digital public infrastructure, limiting data reuse without a legitimate purpose, and create a, a level playing field for the companies working with data would be especially important if we strive to build responsible data economy. Here we can think of the GDPR, European Data Governance Act, and the Public Services Act. And in North America, they've been immensely proud, praised for, for the intentions to do just that, you know, to legitimize and normalize data sharing while prohibiting the extractive data practices. I would say that GAIA-X initiatives and the very idea that we should decouple personal data from technology monopolies is the move in the right direction. And um, one question that you know we've been raised has been raised a lot in these discussions: Wouldn't we stiff innovation with too much regulation? Well, we know now that sustainable data economy will need troughs of data, just like the rentier economy does. And this is going to be a matter of education for the next decade. Users need to feel safe when sharing their data. And I would say that data spaces, data licensing, prohibiting the harmful, the harmful use of AI systems, this is what we can do to make people feel safe when they you know, try to create things or just survive in the digital economy. And uh, once again, in, here in North America, we've, we've been looking to Europe you know, for, for, for the <laughs> regulator innovation. So I would like to conclude here. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. I would ask uh, Gianfranco, Ray, you can turn your cameras back on. Um, you can stop spotlighting so that all four of us can be spotlighted here. Um, maybe uh, I'll jump in first and then, like I said, uh, Gianfranco, Ray, just jump in comments, questions, whatever you like. Um, but I was struck by something that you said near the end where you kind of mentioned harmful use 
and you know data sets are being collected as a part of smart cities mm -hmm. um obviously we know there's one example there's a canadian example outside uh, somewhere in toronto i believe in terms of a smart city and some controversy with google mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of data that was being collected and concerns not per se for how that data was going to be used in the smart city itself, but how that data might be used in other purposes as well. Mm -hmm. That sort of you collect the data for one purpose and it gets used for another purpose, which with GDPR would would be illegal. So anyway, sorry that a long introduction, but what I am curious about is from a regulatory perspective, is the goal to say look we need to like from a gdpr sense we need to collect uh, the amount of data that we need and not anything more mm -hmm. and that our focus is on what kind of data is being collected and that's where the regulatory focus is or are we looking at a regulatory focus that is banning certain uses of data mm -hmm. to say okay it's being collected that's fine that it's being collected but don't use it for X, Y, and Z, and it's more of a prescriptive way of looking at things, or am I completely in a wrong direction and we have to think about anonymization of data, et cetera? So maybe let me just throw that out and let you comment. Oh, thank you. Those are wonderful questions. So um, um, I, I, will, I will start with the example. So I think um, Sidewalk, Sidewalk Labs and Sidewalk Toronto in Canada, uh, it's, it's an excellent example of why we need to be very careful when we uh, when we're dealing with the companies and why the companies cannot be trusted never <laughs> um, and uh, recently I mean I'll just just to explain the, there are there have been some excellent research on uh, on uh, sidewalk Club smart city and why it had failed and in my own work I showed that the key problem here was that they were invited to fill in the role of a policymaker it sounds surprising, but that's exactly what was happening. And it's actually, it happens a lot, you know, in, in across North America, most of the smart city project that's been happening here. It is when uh, the city has a problem or, you know, it lacks financial resources to fix certain infrastructure or, I don't know, provide uh, poor neighborhoods with the internet connection. And the company comes in and says, okay, we're gonna do it for free, but in exchange, we want access to data. and they never been very specific as to what exactly they require during this partnership. And the city, you know, having urban planners and excellent people who understand everything about the public services, they don't really understand what the deal is and the data is being given away for free. And with sidewalk clubs, this was um, even more interesting because, because of the scale of the project and because of how much power the company has required from the city and why it has collapsed at the end is because there was much resistance, not uh, only from the citizens who were concerned about surveillance, obviously, but also from uh, from the public officials who were frankly terrified because uh, the sidewalk clubs demanded um, the ownership of data and where they, they couldn't gain the ownership, they wanted the data to be licensed to them and from all the partners participated in this project they were you know they were acquiring contracts saying that the data will be controlled by alphabet and this is this is one problem another problem that they were sole sourcing the project and this is what i've been talking about in my in my own talk uh, you know we often overestimate the um the abilities of companies to control us. So when we think about digital surveillance, we think, oh, they're going to surveil us. They're going to use it to change our behavior. That's not exactly how it works. And, you know, all of you, anyone who will be listening to this, uh, we've seen those terrible <laughs> targeted ads, right? You, you buy a mattress and you've been followed by, by these ads for, for the rest of your life. And this is how bad the mic control stuff is. What, what really happens is that, you know, they need access to the data to maybe reuse it for something else, to maybe sell it to the data broker. And we need to be concerned about the policy making that happens at the side of the company. We need to be concerned about the access to the government facilities. So we need to be concerned about um, the ownership of physical and digital infrastructure. It's more about the monopolies 
than the digital control and surveillance. And I, I mean, I think we should be immensely grateful for, you know, for this cyber collapse project because what happens in Toronto, for instance, they um, uh, when it was over, um, very abrupt departure, the city decided to rethink its approach to smart cities because they, they realized that what was happening, there was no one in the city who could actually converse with these people to understand properly what was happening, what the, what the technology is, what the you know legal demands are. So right now what they're doing, they're opening up the procurement process. They're hiring people who, I mean, some people I know personally, that's excellent choice. They're hiring people who actually know how smart cities work, who build smart cities. So, you know, having this internal capacity, investing not only um, in the humans who can negotiate with the companies, but also in the digital infrastructure and physical infrastructure servers. You know, where possible, we want to keep data in our service. Where possible, we want to use our networks. Where possible, we want to uh, have a technology we can sustain without you. Because another problem, I'm, I'm going to finish now, sorry, <laughs> I've been talking too long. But uh, another problem that was highlighted by Cyber Class Project is that when they exited, everyone was, you know, frustrated. But what, what would have happened if they build the system? What, what do we do, right? They started a project, they didn't complete it. You know, something came up, a pandemic, financial trouble, and they just bail out, right? And the city, the citizens, we all were left with nothing, with, you know, with a service that the, the government cannot sustain. So this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to, you know, create technology and procure technology that would be open source or, you know, in a way, in any way, they will be, they should be able to, we should be able to maintain them, right, without a company. So I would say that those are three main lessons we've learned from this project. And uh, once again, to reiterate what I've, what I've said, um, the company should not be trusted. And we've seen this a lot with Facebook, with Google, right? One reason why the very concept of privacy has been compromised, why people don't really understand what privacy means anymore, is that every time a breach happens or a scandal happens, the company puts out a new privacy statement saying, oh guys, we fixed everything. It's not true. Someone, you know, in I think in uh, Bloomberg wrote an article and they counted how many times Zuckerberg, you know, <laughs> brought apologies to the to his audience. And yeah, sorry, <laughs> maybe I, I I hope I answered your question. <laughs> uh, Anna, I I what did follow up first to that? Oh. Right. Okay, I'll let Ray go first, and then Gianfranco, you second, and then okay. and then I'll jump in too. Everybody will jump. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. Um, in your intro, I heard you say um, that AI technologies have a uh, need to serve the public good. Um, but I wonder where do you draw the line between good and bad? Because I mean, it can get very vague and it become very like in a gray area. So I wonder, like, how do you how do you see that? Well, I think it's a good question, and I think with uh, when it comes to AI, we will need to learn a lot. And um, uh, so I was. Um, I, uh, I was participating um, in a conference this week where um, um, my colleagues were discussing the ex ante regulation, the regulation that comes first, right, when we are trying to anticipate the bad outcomes. And um, so far, AI in this nascent stage, right, we don't really know what to use it for, and basically the companies and the public services are experimenting with it. So uh, one, one use which I think hasn't been harmful is when uh, AI is used to uh, moderate the content on the internet. It's been moderately successful, even though uh, Facebook still uses, I don't know why I'm using <laughs> Facebook again, but they're still using uh, human moderators, but um, AI has been very good uh, at taking down porn and violent content. So I, I would say uh, when we experiment with these technologies, we will learn more about how to use them. Um, I, for one, was trying to find uh, an example of a good use, or like a good public AI case, and I couldn't. Uh, so what I've, what I've found, plenty of research on how AI have been experimented with in, in the social services. For instance, there is an um, um, excellent book uh, from Virginia Eubanks 
called um, Automating Inequality. And in this book, she, re she reviewed three case studies from the United States uh, where the, the um, state social services hired a company to build the AI system to help them disburse scarce finance funds, right? And what happened is that very, very quickly, the algorithm learned to discriminate against single mothers, against people, uh, against people with criminal background, against people who had, you know, previous violations. And um, so what the use of this system was discontinued because it was showed, you know, very uh, vividly that those systems, they're very good at cutting costs but we're not, they're not very good at helping people. And when it comes to social services, we want them to serve. This is not about making money or saving money. This is about helping people in need, right? And apparently AI is very bad at it. So I would say uh, we will need to see how it works. And I'm waiting for, for the research from my British colleagues because I know that uh, the UK has been experimenting with <laughs> with visa approvals, automated visa approvals, they use an AI to screen through the applications, which is terrifying, personally, I find it terrifying. And I, I'm very curious as to how it goes, uh, but I mean, we cannot draw conclusions before, you know, someone studies it closely, but it is very alarming because from what we've learned, one problem with the algorithms, they're not that smart. We are very, we are grossly overestimating their abilities. So what, what happens with them uh, is they use historical data, you know, to work on the data sets they're given. And it almost never works to the benefit of the public or anyone really, except, you know, to save costs. So we will see. <laughs> That's Franco. my answer. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Jim Franco, jump in. Yeah, uh, first of all, Anna, thank you. I wanted to high five you for having <laughs> made uh, Cory Doctorow, one of my personal idol, uh, um, activist and, and uh, sci-fi writer for the months of you who don't know. Um, and uh, I could recognize in, in, your, in your little uh, statement a few of the recurring topics that from, from his, uh, like the, the mind control uh, uh, delusion, let's say. There's another point he always makes that I'm curious to hear your opinion on, and what uh, your and in what way your experience perhaps confirmed that or not. That is, what we often see as the problem with the big tech giants in reality is an antitrust problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it is the fact that we allow them to become too big, and that is the problem. The origin, the, the original sin of this, not necessarily, for example, that the business model are extractive, because if there were many of these operators. The fact that they were building their uh, business model on the fact that they need to exploit the data in some way it may not be that evil after all. It would not destroy the situation, the market as we as we see. What, what's your opinion of that? And have you seen, uh, say, options to break those monopolies? What's the attitude, perhaps, in in uh, in Canada uh, from that point of view? Um, thank you, thank you, Jean Franco. Uh, I am a big fan of Corey, and he's he's great in all always. Um, so I, I would say that I, I do agree with Cory Doctor on, uh, um, on the fact that antitrust is key here. And I, I began with it in my introductory um, uh, talk that we should try and decouple data from tech companies and where possible. So like we need to prohibit uh, some users of AI, like social credit systems, and that's what's proposed in the AI Act. Uh, but um, you know, the problem with with the companies that have access to all of our data across the platforms, this is a big problem. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, what was the question again? Um, so wh how do we... I was wondering too, if you agree uh, on that kind of idea that the problem is mostly in the size of these giants. Okay. Oh, and the, the over, how they became overpowering, not necessarily of what they do specifically. Yes, yes, I do agree. Uh, so what, I, what I've seen, I've, I've interviewed uh, people who um, build data trusts across the world. And um, one thing I've been hearing repeatedly is that it is immensely hard to enter the digital market now. If you're a startup, you basically work towards, you know, being bought out. And that's that's the goal, because you cannot compete with any of them. 
And those companies, they are so powerful. I've, I've heard so many terrible stories about how Google steals your property, intellectual property, or they, uh, you know, put out um, um, an, a court order against you. There are so many legal ways to limit, you know, the rise of a young company. And also the question of the funding. Um, I mean, venture capital is not what it used to be. So I, I think Corey is not the only one who says that. He's just, you know, the most, uh, he's well known and people listen to him. But in academia, I see this a lot. And, you know, my colleagues who work in technology law, or in, in political economy, in sociology, media studies, basically everyone says that the size is the problem. The size is the problem. It just, because, and, and you know, like, like I mentioned, it's not just the size, it's the fact that, uh, they learn to manipulate the markets they trading in. And the fact, you know, even that, say, Amazon, there was this recent, another one, uh, investigation from the um, uh, U.S. Department of Justice, I believe, uh, against Amazon. And what they found is that um, Amazon is, you know, stiffen, <laughs> they're basically playing against their own users, the companies who trade in the Amazon market. Amazon uses the data, you know, to push them out. This is not okay. This is not a digital market. This is not the market at all. And this shouldn't be happening, right? And I think that, um, you know, there is a slight difference here between Canada and the U.S., so I, I, I say this separately. Um, U.S. is a very interesting place, and um, until recently, I was very happy with uh, with the developments. Uh, like, you know, Joe Biden introduced the uh, first comprehensive privacy law, which has failed. Um, they they started several investiga antitrust investigations against Google, Facebook, and Amazon. This ongoing, some of them completed, and the charges have been brought against the companies. So um, the way America works, I think this will go towards uh, the antitrust measures, and maybe we'll see new laws in the states, you know, targeting the, these companies. Because when it became apparent that uh, they basically control the market and they're more powerful than the state, this is concerning. And we will see what the U.S. is going to do. They won't be doing much about privacy. You know, they 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 have this. Um, there's an interesting study by uh, Meg Leather Jones. It's a short article actually about the difference in privacy cultures in in the U.S. and Europe. And she says here that consumer privacy was invented to not deal with privacy, which is a good point actually. Like what it means is, um, you know, the U.S. laws. Um, until recently, you know, some some states have have introduced new bills or legislations, uh, but until recently, uh, U.S. regulations were basically protecting users from you know data breach, and the rest it's not the state control concern. I mean, if it happens, it happens. If you if you've uh, signed out your data, that's that's your problem, and um, the benefit of this approach, and we discussed with, this was David yesterday, is that we see Silicon Valley. This is all, they, they, they started like that, right? The immense military capital and this freedom of doing whatever you want, this is what we have. The problem is that, I mean, why why I keep calling this rentier economy, it's not productive. It's about collecting rents without offering much. It's about collecting rents and, you know, stifling the market. You know, what, what used to work doesn't work anymore. And the problem is uh, with the U.S., it, it seems like they don't want to do much right now about that. Like, we'll see what happens with the antitrust legislation, whether they will, I don't know, try to limit uh, these companies in any way. We'll see. But the fact that the privacy law has failed, this is very concerning. And it also, you know, it puts in jeopardy the European attempts to regulate the market because and understandably, it creates this gray area in, for the American companies, and it limits the ability of European companies to compete because, well, on the other side, we, we should remember that for the American company, for all of these big tech companies, uh, there are three, no, actually two main markets, no, three main markets, US, Canada, and Europe. So most of the money they make, they make where you are. And uh, so they will have to live somehow with the new regulations. But, you know, to make this work, to make the AI Act work, 
Europe needs cooperation from the US and we'll see how it works. So far, it's unclear. When it comes to Canada, it's even more interesting because Canada has always been in this um, intermediary position, like we we'll look to Europe a lot and, uh, you know, some of the provincial regulations, they're copycats of the GDPR, which is good, actually. Um, but there is also this fear and there's a lot of lobbyism, not necessarily in a bad sense, uh, around, you know, keeping the market uh, unregulated, keeping the market, you know, safe from the regulations. And um, two years ago, before the pandemic started, um, there have been several attempts to modify PIPIDA and uh, the Public Services Act. And uh, there is new bill, but it it kind of leaves the privacy aside. It puts aside and it, uh, you know, works with the uh, media companies instead. And uh, it's also very controversial, but it, it seems like the privacy legislation has stalled. So we will see. I mean, and I think this is very concerning that this is happening. And, and uh, it's very sad that this is happening both in Canada and the US. I think, I think it will depend largely on on maybe whether we have in Canada people who will push for the you know privacy reform because so far apparently the person who is doing that is not doing that anymore for some reason so um, we'll see yeah, so because um, I, I just I know we're running out of time here but I, I, I want to jump back to the point about competition and antitrust and companies that are too big and connected to smart cities because it strikes me at one point early in the conversation, you talked about, you know, governments don't have an option to fail and to go bankrupt at the end of the day. So if a smart city doesn't work anymore, it's not like, OK, well, we'll shut it down and everybody will move. It, that just doesn't happen. And then it strikes me as well that, OK, you have a single company like Google that will come in and provide services across the spectrum. So traditionally, if I go to a city level and I think about receiving services, I have a particular number of players that are delivering electricity, right? Mm -hmm. We regulate electric markets in particular ways if we're concerned about a monopoly situation. And I have, you know, for every other service that is being provided, uh, they're kind of individualized. And then all of a sudden, the difference in my mind when it comes to big tech is is they cover all sectors at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So do you think that that is an important component of this competitiveness discussion and sort of the antitrust regulation that might need to take place or or do you think it's something else? Uh, yes, I do think it's a problem. Um, and especially it's a problem. I mean, we can, we can look um, at Google. The Google would be a good example. Um, uh, a few years ago, three years ago, um, DeepMind in London uh, partnered with um, NHS, you know, to acquire data on, I think, 40 million of British patients. And you probably know what happens next. They promised, they swear that they won't be part of the Google database. Now they are officially. It's It's been a, like a legal trickery, but they can do it. And we've seen this a lot. And uh, what what I've seen in the, I, I mean, I, I highly recommend to everyone to read uh, Sidewalk Lab's proposal for uh, Canadian Smart City. I, I'm happy to share it, uh, but I think it's online still because it's it's very scary, you know, the idea that um, it's very dystopian and, and the idea that one company will provide you uh, with one digital ID for all your services, all, all your services will be hosted on uh, Alphabet's, uh, in Alphabet service and uh, the company will help you, you know, to get that experience uh, when you're dealing with insurance companies and healthcare companies, they will also help you with the auto insurance and blah, 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 whatever. And uh, this is, like when you see um, the massive power that comes with the installation of these little screens and with the with you know legal partnerships you and your city entering uh, when such a project is being put to life, I am I am very concerned and I think um, like like many of my colleagues here I'm very interested and I'm following uh, vigorously you know the European developments in this area because probably the most important uh, contribution Europe is doing right now is the conversation itself. 
because uh, it, it may not be evident uh, to you, but in North America, there is no consensus about what privacy is. And, uh, you know, there is no consensus about Google or Alphabet or Amazon being, you know, harmful to the people. And all this potential threats that I see, you know, research in this area, you know, my friends who are, you know, all work in different areas, they may not necessarily agree on, they may not necessarily see those as threats. And I think, um, you know, having this conversation, making it public, making it loud, I think this is what we should do. And obviously, uh, I mean, I see a lot of value. I mean, I'll say it like this. Um, I've seen many municipalities uh, giving up the open data approach in the old way, you know, when you just put the data out and, you know, anyone can use it. Because you don't want to have it all out. You want to know what's being reused and you need to know what, I mean, who reuses it and for what purpose. So I think, um, I, I don't know if breaking up the big tech the way Elizabeth Warren was proposing it is an option, but um, if we cannot allow, you know, if we can stop this movement of converging all the services in the hands of the five big players, I think we should do it. And it is very important to have everyone on board, you know, even people who are pro market, who are uh, who don't believe that privacy is a problem. They need to understand that the problem will come in different form. Maybe it's not privacy. Maybe it's media concentration, market concentration. Maybe it's you not being able to choose the proper product and using this different languages and, you know, highlighting the variety of problems that come with this project. I think it's very important. Concentration is a problem. And I mean, you know, what, what surprises me is uh, we talk about this as if it has never happened before. <laughs> and, you know, oil companies, banks, financial industry, we've seen this a lot. You know, every time the industry gets too big, it gets concentrated. It gets tough, stiff, sorry. And I mean, we, we need to do something about it. And it won't kill the market. It won't, it doesn't mean that we need to give up the technologies we're using. We just need to do this in a different way. So that would be my answer. Great. Uh, any other panelists have anything that they want to say? Otherwise, we, we're running out of time. So um, we have a <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> so I think from there, I'll already say thank you very much. And I really appreciate that you took the time out this morning. Uh, this thank morning you. for you for to talk to us. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for everybody that's been listening. Uh, we'd like to thank you. Wish you a good evening, and hear from you next time on Data Talks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. And then cut. <laughs> well, that's that's Ray's responsibility. Oh no, I don't.